Welcome, everybody, to today's Building My Legacy podcast. I have with me again today, Rick Maurer. You may have remembered him. He was on our podcast talking about his book, Seizing Moments of Possibility, a great, wonderful um, book, and especially in today's world, right, where we're always wondering about what's next and what is possible <laughs> to make things happen anymore. And he's also a speaker and a consultant and works a great deal with companies in terms of change, change management, team building, engagement, all of the things that we're so desperately in need of right now. And so today I'm going to focus with Rick on some of his work that he's doing now on change. He's written a delightful book um, that is you'll find very helpful. We'll put a link to that in um, in the show notes, so you have you can get access to it through Rick. Um, but let's talk about some of what you've done and some of your observations about why humans are so resistant to change. <laughs> right? I'll let you get started on that. Okay, I got my soapbox here. I'm going to stand on it. Here I go. Um, in some ways, I realize that we all have the capacity to resist change, but I think often it's we we resist being changed as about as opposed to just resisting change outright. Like, how dare you take that project? How dare we move to Omaha? How dare we, you know? It's that kind of thing that can really get us rankled versus wow, I'm really glad we're making this change right now. And I'm really glad I'm going to get to be a part of it. Yes, it's extra work, but boy, is it critical to our success. And that part, that, that emotional part of people going, whoa, this is important. That's what gets left out too often. You know, and like, for instance, let's say you and I are executives. And so we're good people, we're smart people, and we come up with this, oh, man, we need to do this. And you're going, oh, Rick, you're brilliant. I go, well, thank you, Lois, you're brilliant too. And we go back and forth and we say, well, okay, we got this big challenge. Here's what we can do. And we've already come up with a direction we could go. And then we tell other people. And so the problem is there are two things going on. One is what's this project, but the other challenge which happens before what's this project is why are we even talking about a change and we miss that step quite often we might have a few slides but what's critical is that people go like when you and i talk they go whoa that i hadn't thought of it that way oh, that makes sense that doesn't mean they're happy about it but they're going i better pay attention to this and, and oddly, you know, it, it, that's still missing from a lot of meetings that I go to. Or when I'm talking to clients, they'll go, oh, yeah. Why do I need this? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you've, uh, you're also talking about creating a system, a process where things get blended because we tend to put something out. We train for it. Then we have the next, the next, the next. Mm -hmm. But we don't look at if we've done three, four courses, have we blended them together so that we have a coherent process? So yeah. talk a little bit about that. Sure thing. Um, first of all, I agree with 100% with what you're saying. And we tend not to have a coherent process just for those opening 10 minutes on our Tuesday morning meeting where we go, Oh no, you know, because that's a real, that's a real opportunity to engage people. Um, the guy who used to be the head of Scandinavian airlines, SAS, his name was Jan Carlson. Jan Carlson. Yes. Okay. I remember. So him. Okay. Go ahead. And he said, um, you know, every day there, it depends on which thing you read. Either there are thousands or there are millions of opportunities for us to engage our customers in a respectful way that does something for them. So if you've ever been to an airport and you can't get information about what's happening with the flight and that, it's not that these people can magically say, we'll get a plane for you. I mean, it's it's that somebody comes over and says, are you okay? Is there, you have a question? He goes, yeah, as a matter of fact, I do. I said, yeah, that's, 
you know, sorry to say that's a really big problem right now. Let, let me look at, let me see when it's actually, what we think it's going to go. That just that little thing can often get people to go, oh, somebody's paying attention. You know, I'll give you a really simple example. Uh, I won't name the uh, cell phone provider that I use, but I like them. But I went into the store the other day because if something was, just wasn't working. And there were probably three customers in there. And I think there were four employees. Nobody looked at me. I mean, I was there for 20 minutes. I mean, this is a small place, you know, <laughs> and nobody said a word. And there was this one woman just behind the counter. And I said, can you help me? She's no, 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 she does. And I, I have no idea why she was behind the counter. And finally, once, you know, somebody, a customer left, this woman says, Oh, can I help you? And I said, yeah. And she said, oh, okay. And she fixed the problem. But the simple thing she could have done or any of them could have done is say, hey, uh, you, as you can see, we're kind of, we're really busy right now. It, can you wait a few minutes? Because it's going to take us a little bit of time. You know, you know, there's a place to get coffee or whatever. Just something little that I was acknowledged could really make a difference. And I was starting, you know, I wasn't fuming. It wasn't that big a deal, but it was enough like, why am I standing here? I mean, there were two or three times when I thought, why don't I leave and just go to another store? I mean, it just, it's so simple. Does this make sense? Oh, it, it is so simple and it makes so much sense. And I can hear already in people's minds, the dollars ticking because they go, well, that costs too much. Well, if it costs too much, what does it cost to lose me as a customer? You know, not just Rick Mauer. I mean, they, they can live without Rick Mauer. But if if so many people walk into a place, and generally with that company, I do not feel a level of indifference. So I, I like the company. But if enough people walk in and go, and yeah, yeah, it's it's really hard to get good service. I mean, if that starts to be the word on the street, you got a problem. Uh, get, get, do I have time for a story? You have time for a story? Go ahead. I love your story. Right. Okay. If I told this the last time we talked, please stop me. Harley Davidson is a revered brand of motorcycles. I mean, people who ride Harleys don't just ride bikes. They ride Harleys. I mean, That's it's true. Just, it's, and I think it was the late 70s. They were having real problems. And the, their, their quality was going down. Uh, like lots of repairs that hadn't been there before and they were losing customers. And then they discovered quality improvement, which was very big with Deming and, <laughs> like and they changed it, and they turned the company around. And I heard a, a senior vice president from Harley say, so you would, you probably are wondering, well, why didn't we know that we were losing customers and people were dissatisfied? In fact, what people would say is, Hey, Lois, if you're thinking of buying Harley, buy two, one to ride and one for parts. I mean, it was that bad. And he said, so you might have thought, well, why didn't we know that? And he said, here's the problem. The writing was on the wall, but we thought it was a forgery. And so the information can be right there in front of us. And it's just, we just don't take it in. Um, and that's the most senior levels, you know, and it's just, it's that kind of stuff that if, if we had a process where people go, whoa, look, look at that. What, what's going on with our sales? What's going on with our customer repair? Well, that employee, that informal employee survey that we did last month. Wow, look at that. That There's a lot that ought to get our attention. And fortunately for Harley, it did get their attention, but it, it really took a while. You know, so problems sometimes open up our minds. Sometimes actually problems shut people down even further. So how do we open people up? We go into a meeting, we go into a brainstorming, a strategic planning or whatever. Mm -hmm. How do we open people up so we can start to have a real discussion? Okay. So I've got to ask, what's our role when we go to that meeting? Because that'll make a difference. Are we the consultant, the leader, just a member of the group? You choose. You can choose whoever you want to be at the moment. Okay. So just for, for a moment, uh, let's say the person going into the meeting is the person leading this particular meeting. And let's say she goes, oh, no, God, I got I to gotta leave this meeting again. It's just, I mean, you know, we've all been to meetings like that. 
So I will say to clients, all right. Just to interrupt you, it was the number one thing I heard during COVID was finally, we don't have to go to meetings. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah, that's sad, but yeah. Um, so, so what we could do, whether we're the leader or at least we can influence the leader say, all right, we re- we realize this meeting, these meetings are not productive. They're, they waste people's time. What's one thing we could do that might make a difference. So here's where we get it wrong. We go, Oh, you know, I just read this book and well, why don't we get, bring the consultant in and we'll go through these chapters and we'll do this activity and that. I mean, as a consultant, I like that, but I think what we ought to be doing is stuff that's really simple. Um, the, um, I, I knew, there was a guy who ran a, a small company, Rhino Foods, and they, they had to do downsizing. They had never done down, downsizing ever in the history of the company. It was family owned. And he said, to everybody, it was like 90 people there. That was the company. He said, look, he said, I think I've done everything I possibly can to either increase revenue or cut costs. I mean, I just can't find anything. And I'm really sorry to say that in the first time in our history, we've got to downsize. And I'm really not happy with that. And then he said, and this is the, the little thing. He said, look, I can't make any promises because I really think we've thought of everything. If you have any ideas, where we might be able to save money that I, I will listen to them and I will listen to them seriously. 90 people, they came up with 111 ideas. Oh, wow. Yeah. Now all he did differently was almost, I, I don't know if it was, but it seems like almost like an afterthought. Hey, if you've got any ideas, I'll take them seriously. So he opened the door to that. I think people trusted him enough to know that this is really sincere. And then when he got all these things, he called some people together and said, we got to do something with these. And they ended up with like five big uh, themes for this. And they weathered that storm without any layoffs. Wow. So it's just, yeah, it's just that because everybody, I think, is probably in a, to, to, in a meeting where downsizing or layoffs are being announced. And it's usually very formal. It's, it's you can feel the pain in the room and the leader can hardly wait to get off. Uh, the stage and go, okay, here's Rick from HR. He's going to talk about what we're going to do. And I, you know, and he, this guy had the guts actually stay there and say, look, uh, I don't think, I don't think there's a good answer out there, but I really, you know, hope hope we come up with something. So here's what's interesting. I think soon as we have a problem with our bottom line and we've got, especially if you've got um, shareholders, stakeholders that you have to give reports to, the for, the go-to position in those companies tends to be, we'll just cut people. That's where we can get the biggest impact yes. in the shortest period of time and meet our numbers, right? Yeah. Uh, that's the go-to position. And so if your goal is always, do I hit my quarterly goals? Yeah. And that is your backup strategy to hitting your goals. That will always be your strategy. Yeah. However, yes. if, if you have a strategy such as that, and after, I mean, you may have to do your first cut, but then say, you know what, we got next quarter coming up. And if we're not going to cut again, what are we going to do? That'd be much better than what, you know, what most people do. Yeah. I, I, you know, what was I going to say? I just lost my own train of thought. This is scary. This is maybe the most brilliant thing I've ever thought of, and I can't think what it was. <laughs> and, uh, I yeah, I do know what it, what it was. It was just an aside. The big problem with using layoffs as our thing of choice because it's easy. I mean, it's not fun, but it's easy to go. Okay, this group, bam, you're you're gone. The problem is that sends a message throughout the organization that you're not important. And even if you're not in the team that was just axed, it's starting to send this ripple like, uh, are we going to be next? And and so it seems on paper, it seems like, well, this makes sense. It's a good way to save money. The problem is that it's it doesn't make sense in that you you can really mess with morale. You can mess with people's sense of really wanting to work there. 
So it's not that people are going to lay down on the job, but what you're going to get, as one CEO said, is all I got was malicious compliance. He got enough energy so the project stayed alive, the work stayed going, but it wasn't high quality stuff. So people didn't lose their jobs because they, you know, we were in the meetings, we are doing what we're supposed to do. So I want to talk about malicious compliance because that's part of what you deal with with change in organizations. Mm-hmm is often the way we implement change results in malicious compliance. Would you talk about that? Because I I, I don't think we talk about it at all, Mm -hmm. or or not as much as we should. I I agree with you. Um, I believe that when we get malicious compliance for people, Rick, could you do me a favor and just move your computer down a little bit? Because when you are thinking, I lose your, there you go. I lose your head. Like this? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. There you go. There's That's absolutely awesome. no reason for me to look down. There is nothing here other than a blank sheet of paper. So, okay. Um, so I think one reason we get malicious compliance you know, is that uh, people just, they, they don't believe that what's going on is actually very important. They don't believe that their work matters. And so all I need to do is get through the day and then everything will be okay. And sometimes people might be doing some task that doesn't seem to be all that important and maybe that's okay. But for the most part, as soon as we get that, we're we're turning otherwise really good students into C students, you know, and people are doing the job. They're not gonna fail because they don't wanna get kicked out, but they're not doing the work that could inspire us to go, wow, what a great idea. Hey, let's, and, and feel that excitement. And sometimes you can walk in a room and even if you, if even if they're speaking a different language, man, you, quite often you can tell if malicious compliance is going on or if there's that vibrancy and that excitement. And that's, you know, that's what we're looking for. And it just, uh, and it doesn't cost more money to do that. It means blending this stuff into what we're already doing. So, Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about blending what we do so we don't end up with disengagement and yeah. uh, malicious compliance, which it would be the worst case scenario of the two. What can we really do? Okay. Um, by the way, the, the questions you're asking right now are the questions that I really would suggest that leaders and their coaches and consultants be asking. So what can we do? Because, and the reason I'm saying that's such a great question is I don't think quite often people need to go to more training or read another book. Of course, they always ought to read my books, but, uh, but I don't think, you know, sometimes people need that, that kind of fundamental stuff, but basically say, all right, so what's getting in the way? What could we be doing? That's, that's a really big deal. And now when I look at it deeper in my, I came up with this model of why people support us and why they resist us. And I'm just going to talk about the resistance side for a minute. And it's, there are these three levels. The first level, all of them happen all, they're all alive all the time, but level one is the easiest one to work with. Level two is harder. Level three is hardest. So level one is, I don't get it. It's just purely intellectual. You know, I just don't understand what you're saying. I'm going to come back to the positive side. At level two is, I don't like it. And this is an emotional reaction. There's, and by emotional, I'm talking about it's fear, it's survival. I mean, it's not like, well, I don't like Brussels sprouts. Can we get something else? That's, that's a really low budget kind of thing. It's like, whoa, this is real. We got a kid in college. We've got, you know, it's all that. So suddenly a change that has an impact on 10,000 people now has an impact on one person, and that's me, and I'm worried. So level two is this emotional, fear-based kind of thing. And the third one is, I don't like you. And what that really means is we may like each other perfectly fine, but working on projects, we don't trust each other. We don't have confidence in each other. So let's say I'm the, the one where that level three is not good. And so somebody says, well, Lois, why? And because, well, you know, Rick, he's just not trustworthy. 
Oh, you mean he lies? No, he doesn't lie, but he'll get excited about something and go, oh, here's what we need to do. I've almost finished this book. So we're going to have a meeting tomorrow. And, you know, a lot of us do that out of excitement. But the, the real problem is people don't trust that, that they're in good hands. Okay. The positive side, so, I, so everybody's not depressed, is at level one, people get it. They understand what's going on. That doesn't mean they're going to do anything with it. All it means is they understand. And too often, our PowerPoint presentations just focus on level one. You know, okay, here are the 82 steps to do this. Here are the numbers and blah, blah, blah. And that may be critically important, but it's generally not the stuff that's going to get people excited. Okay. So level two, which is I don't like it, is I do like it. I'm excited about it. I want to be engaged in that. So rather than that fear and rather than some of the stuff you read that people automatically resist change, if you can capture energy at this level two where people go, whoa, this, yes, it may be scary out there, but boy, am I glad we're addressing it. That's a big deal. And often our plans don't really go into that very much, but I think it's, it's critically important. And then the third one, which has to do with our relationship, I don't like you. And what it really means is I either have trust and confidence in you or I don't. And so quite often, that's the one that will kill an otherwise good idea. And the problem is we can't talk about it. Yeah. So, and, so Wow. And that is so true today. I want to go back. Let's go back to point two. And I want to talk about the symptoms and signs that you see in each. So. I don't, I don't like it. So in a culture where people have been trained not to speak up, for example, or if if they're very worried about what's PC, Mm -hmm. how, what are the signs and symptoms you look for that say, I don't like it? I think, I think I like it is an easier read than the, I don't like it. It is an easier read. Yeah. Because people feel enough confidence that like, wow. We're on the same page here. That's exciting. One of the things, it's often very hard for people to talk about that level two emotional stuff. In fact, what what will happen is, let's say you're making a presentation. You've got all these slides. You've spent a lot of time on it. And so you say, hey, so I'd love to know your reactions to this. And I raise my hand. I am not going to touch level two. It's the third rail on the, you know, in the metro system. Just don't touch it. And they say, Rick, yeah, um, what, what's your reaction? And I go, well, can you go back two slides? I have a question about the, the budget projections. And you go, okay, good. And you're thinking, good, nice level one question. I can answer that. And so what happens is you're acting in good faith and the other people are asking the kind of questions or saying things that are safe to talk about. So have you thought about what cities these regions are going to be moving to? Have you thought about that's all level one stuff? And so it's really hard to get at the level two. And I'd be glad to give a couple of examples that people can use to get at that. Please do, because I think if you're going to move in that direction, you've got to know what to ask so you can open it up. Well, actually, you know, and the first thing is, as a leader or the coach or consultant, we need to have a mindset, pardon me, that allows us to be curious about what those people are thinking and feeling. Because if we don't, you can be telling me, this heartwarming stuff or whatever, and I'm not taking it in because I'm just thinking about the next slide and we've got to get to it pretty quickly because, you know, we got to give up the room and that kind of thing. So here's one of the things. Um, I, I did this years ago. Uh, a big consulting firm w- was working with a, a client, telecommunications company, on a big project called business process reengineering, very controversial at the time. And it was planning group. And my job was to come in for like half a day, teach my stuff and then leave. That's all I was doing. And so with that consulting firm, that's what I did. And so they had their consultant there and the the planning team from the company. And I'm doing my presentation and said, Rick, next week the bottom is gonna drop. And I said, what do you mean? And I said, oh, and other people go, oh yeah, he's right. It's gonna be awful. And and this this is an office building and I'm going, what? What's going on? They said, oh, it's just going to be, Rick, there's going to be blood everywhere. I mean, horrible images. And they said, wait, 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 folks, what's going on next week? And they said, we're holding a meeting. And I go, yeah. And they go, it's an all-day meeting. 
And what kept coming out then was it's the first meeting we have with the key stakeholders saying, this is the first draft of our plan. And they said, people are going to hear, what should we do? And suddenly these 15 men and women looked at me like with puppy dog eyes, like, what should we, you know? And the temptation would be to go, well, you know, turn to page 42 in my book and there's an answer. That's absolutely the wrong thing to do. But, but they really were hungry and I couldn't just make up an answer for them. And I, so I did something on the spot, which has now become part of what I do called create, I call it creating the list. And I said, all right, um, does everybody here know somebody's coming to that meeting? And everybody goes, oh yeah. What's going to be on their minds? And people started telling me. So these are just the planning group and they're talking about those other people. And, and I'm writing on the flip chart as fast as I can. And I knew what to do with it. And I said, okay, I just taught you those three levels. Let me, let me take the green marker. Which of these have to do with facts and figures, level one? And I underlined those. And which of these are level two? Let me use a different color marker. And that has to do with emotions, fear or excitement. And then I used a third color marker. marker. Which, which of these have, have to do with lack of trust or confidence or trust? In this instance, everything on that list was negative. What I find doing this with organizations, it's often, it's a blend of things. But when you look at that, in their case, just imagine this sheet where I was writing about as small as I could, and then they would say, you know, oh yeah, that's level three. I mean, it was it was eye-opening for these people. I mean, they had all this data already. They didn't have to do a survey. They didn't have to, you know, say, well, you know, we, we got this consulting firm and in six months, months from now, they'll be turning in a report and that'll, I mean, they had it immediately. And as they're looking at it, somebody said, oh, that's why the bomb is going to drop. And people said, what are you talking about? I said, we designed that eight hour meeting to deal with level one issues, facts, figures, timelines. People are not, and obviously those things are important, but that's not what people are coming in with. They're coming in with fear and lack of trust in us. And people in the room are going, yeah. Now here's what was brilliant on their part. They said to the consultant for the big firm and me, they said, could we take the next hour and redesign that meeting? And we said, oh, wow. yeah, they did not ask us, hey, do you got a good plan for doing that meeting? Do you have, they said, could we just move our chairs together? And at first, when they started talking, there was energy, but it was that kind of subdued energy. And then it started to break up a little and there was more laughter. And by the end of the hour, they said, yeah, we came up with something we think is really good. And it turned out to be really good. The meeting went over very well. And so I, in fact, I wrote a free ebook called The Magic List. I'm like, how do you, how do you might be able to gather that information the way I talked about it, but you could do like a quick survey. You could do, you know, hanging out with people in the hallway. I mean, it's just, but basically that's critical information. And if you don't have it and you pretend that it's going to go away, uh, you really get yourself in trouble. So my word is, you know, uh, if people are going to work with me, that's what we're going to focus on. And if they don't like focusing on that, then I'm not the guy for them. And so. so Rick, you can't get to the third level if you haven't gone through the second level. Or can you? You can. Uh, yeah, it's, that's a really good question. All three are alive all the time, either working for or against us. So I, okay, so I report to you. And at level three, I really trust you. You know, you're a good leader. You listen to people. You, you make good decisions. And I, I'll go, okay, so you like the idea? Actually, no, I don't. I'm really scared about this idea. But I'm willing to keep listening because, Lois, you're the one telling us, I want to hear that. So having that foundation of trust can make a huge, huge difference. You know, it means we're on the same side trying to figure out how to work with this. Got it. Okay. So you can go have one. Leverage three to get to two is that without two, you're you're right. So I can have facts. I can trust you. I'm you've got my ear because of the trust. Yeah. And now I'm trying to filter. Do I like it? But I'll filter it maybe differently because I have a certain level of trust with you. I know you have my best interest at heart. Is that part of what you're saying? I am. No, that's very good. I mean, I, I think of a large company, like it's a fortune, I don't know, like a fortune 50 company. And this, the guy who used to be the CEO 
people who had never met him trusted him. And he, they were doing this management program for up and coming managers. And each month they would do it. And he would kick off those meetings. This was when he was the COO and not the CEOs. So there's over 100,000 people work there. And he would personally come and kick these off. He easily could have sent somebody and say, hey, Herb was, uh, you know, I uh, wish he could be here, blah, 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 blah. But the guy is there and he does it live. And he said, you know, I'm really happy to be here with you because you're the future of our company. That's why we're doing the program. And I'm glad that you're taking part in this. Um, we've got a choice. I got an hour with you. I'm excited about that. Uh, I'm going to give you an option. One option is we have the PowerPoint presentation we show to Wall Street. He said, it's a very good presentation. If you want to know where we sit in the marketplace, it's really good. Or we don't even have to turn the projector on and I can just try to address questions. Okay. I been, was in the back of the room many, many times. Never once did I hear people say, show us the slides. And what he did was he would take people seriously, even if he disagreed with them, they knew they had been listened to. You know, and one time I said to people in, in my group, it was like 30 people, I said, how many of you, this is the first time you ever saw this guy? And for a lot of people, that was true. And I said, all right, imagine that he walks in right now and said, you know, I need some help on a big project. And frankly, I don't have the details of it. And I, but I need some people who would volunteer to work with me for maybe the next nine months, pretty much full time. Uh, I wish I could give you more information because I'm still thinking about it, but that's why I need people. So it's something like this at level one, it's just, it's, you know, kind of, you know, there's nothing there yet. And at level two, it's also, is this going to be good for my career? Is it, you know, and I would say to people, so based on that, would any of you volunteer? And almost everyone said, oh yeah. And I said, why? You know, he didn't even tell you what it is. He doesn't even know what it is. Why? And they said, because we trust him. And I said, what do you mean you trust him? <laughs> and, you know, I'm really trying to prod them into this. They said, listen to him. He pays attention to people. You know, he's he listens to people. He's willing to be influenced. What's not to like? You know, it's so not- it really is to your point that, yeah, if you, if you can really get that level three stuff going, then it makes it much easier to work with even the fears that might be at level two or the lack of understanding at level one. And we don't spend much time, at least my experience, really looking at level three when we're working as consultants or as leaders. Rick, our time is going so fast. What have we omitted that we should have talked about? I I didn't talk about being a barista, did I? Oh, no. Let's talk about it. All right. I love lattes, so I'd love this conversation. Okay, good. So... Where I would start with this stuff, and I realize some of the, your people, uh, listeners, are pretty far down the road doing some really good work. That's great. But if you're saying, you know, I don't do enough to get people engaged, um, where I would start is really simply, um, we have a coffee shop about a mile from where I live here in Arlington, Virginia. And invariably, now that I can go back there, there's invariably there's somebody in line who's ordering a latte, you know. And I never once heard that person go, hey, uh, give me a latte, but uh, hold the milk. Because you don't do that, right? And, <laughs> That's cute. That's true. And so, and when you see a good barista, they blend the coffee and the steamed milk in a way that is just goodness, uh, in a way that you can't tell where one of the flavors ends and the other begins. It's just done brilliantly. That's what I try to work on, say to my clients. All right, so you got this meeting. Everybody hates the Tuesday afternoon meeting. What could you do to start to blend in the human part of it? Not a big deal, not a new meeting, not have pizza or anything. There's nothing wrong with any of that stuff. I'm talking about what's already on the books. What could you do that might actually add some vitality? And it's just that kind of thing I would really, you know, try to, in the book that you talked about, is to really get people to think about that kind of stuff. Like, oh, yeah. Okay. So <laughs> those are big, big pieces, Rick. And I appreciate it so much. For those of you who are listening, um, your magic list, can you make that available to people in that in through the show notes? And then also your book in terms of does change have to be so hard your latest ebook oh, um, for those those of you who are listening he has 
Rick has a marvelous process of change that he talks about in that book. And I think you'll find it very helpful. Um, certainly, he would be an excellent resource if you're getting engaged in a change process within your organization. So is that okay yeah, if I make I'll that, send that offer? Over. Yeah, I'll send it over. Okay. So thank you so much, Rick, for being with us today. I oh, it's, it's it. always a pleasure. And for those of you who are listening to Building My Legacy podcast today, thank you so much. Remember to visit our website at www.buildtomorrowwithanumber2.com and also our new website, which is www.startwithcollaboration.com. So I look forward to seeing you all very soon again. And again, Rick, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. It was a pleasure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for watching my video. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell button above. Leave comments. We'd love to hear what you think. And visit our other social media links as well. Thanks much.